Hey friends, this is Jordan with O and Co Games. Before I got into game development, I started my career in data analytics. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in information systems and whether it was intentional or not, I ended up gravitating toward the world of data analytics. I think it's largely because the first company I worked for was a data analytics company and it was just the easiest path forward at the time to make a living. Anyway, my career has since evolved and I'm much more entrenched in the world of user experience design now, but data analytics has still always been a critical piece of my day-to-day -day work. User insights, whether they're from qualitative findings like those provided by usability tests or from quantitative findings like those found by digging through millions of rows of data in web analytics, have always been at the forefront of my career. I'm constantly focused on understanding people, their needs, wants, and behaviors, and then designing solutions to fit those needs, wants, and behaviors. Connecting with people and truly understanding them has always been something I'm extremely passionate about. So naturally, that passion is going to make its way into my process for designing video games. For any of you who have been following the progress on our game Tethergeist, you know very well that we are laser focused on continual playtesting and feedback. With that said, there's this whole other side of gathering information about playtests, that is the quantitative data analytics side, rows upon rows of data points. If only there was a way to track things in game, like how many times people fail at certain obstacles or how often they pause to skip cutscenes. Well, it turns out there is a way. Lots of ways, actually. So in this video, I'll be going through our process of setting up in-game analytics and how we're using Steam stats to see everything you guys are doing in our game. Then I'll talk about how we're adjusting our game's design based on what we found. Okay, so the first step to getting analytics set up was to choose an analytics tool. We looked at a few options, but ultimately decided we'd be able to do everything we needed to do directly in Steam using Steam Stats. Steam Stats is kind of a hidden gem. I think it was initially developed with the intention of bolstering Steam's achievement system, allowing developers to track things like deaths, then give their players achievements like, congratulations, you've died a hundred times in our game. But it can be used for so much more than just achievement systems. Using Steam's API and custom variables made by you, you can pull summary data about all of your players, then use that data to generate reports on the macro view of player behavior in your game. The trick is you just need to have your game on Steam to do it. A demo would work, or in our case, even a playtestable build would work. So with that as an option for us, we first uploaded our playtest version of Tethergeist to Steam, which is all of chapter one of the game. Steam has this lovely request access option where we can release our game in a playtest state as a sort of pre-demo build. This provided us us with the game's Steam ID that we could then use to integrate Steam stats into our game's code in GameMaker. GameMaker has an add-on you can install that allows you to send data to Steam, and while it wasn't the most intuitive thing to get integrated, I was able to figure it out with a little bit of trial and error. While there are a lot of resources out there explaining how to integrate Steam with engines like Unity or Unreal, there honestly aren't tons of resources out there explaining how to do it with GameMaker Studio. So if you'd like me to make a tutorial video on integrating Steam stats with your GameMaker game, let me know in the comments. Anyway, with Steamworks integrated into GameMaker, I then needed to get my game and Steam talking to each other. I first set up a bunch of custom variables in Steam stats that I wanted to track. Things like how many times players die in my game, how many secrets they've collected, how many times they pause, things like that. Since these are all custom variables, you can pretty much track anything you want in your game. I decided to get pretty granular to where I could see even which rooms people were dying in and how many people complete each section of the game. My goal was to see which sections of the game are most difficult for players and where players are most likely to quit playing. I honestly got way more insights than just that, but I'll get into that here in just a bit. With the variables defined in Steam stats, it just became a matter of setting up my game's code to update those variables in Steam as players progress through the game. I won't get too much into the details here, but again, if you want a tutorial on how to do this stuff in GameMaker Studio specifically, let me know in the comments. Okay, so the next step was for me to actually go and gather the data I wanted to track. I released a video announcing that we have a playtestable build on Steam and gave it a couple weeks for the data to come in. Steam provides all of the stored variables as raw JSON, so when I was ready to build a report, I first had to convert that JSON into a CSV file that I then imported into a Google Sheet. Within the Google Sheet, I made a few additional calculations on that raw data. Things like completion rates, averages, and percentages of players who made it to certain points in the game. Things like that. Now, while the spreadsheet is already a step up from the raw JSON, it's not enough to truly understand what the data is telling us. One key element of data analytics is organizing the information into actionable insights that tell a story. 
This is commonly done through dashboards. So I plugged this spreadsheet into Google Looker Studio, their free to use dashboarding tool, and I created this report. Now, if you've made it this far into the video, I think you deserve to see what we found. So let's dive into the data. I organized this report into a flow that helps tell a story of what our players are doing in Tethergeist. I built this summary section at the top to provide an overview of the key data points we're tracking. And then I added subsequent sections below in this report to more granularly see what is behind those numbers. I should also point out that this report accounts for about two weeks worth of data, the two weeks right after we launched the playtestable demo on Steam. As you can see here, we had 546 people start the game, which is about 25% of our current wishlist count. These players are the ones who made it past the title screen and actually started playing Tethergeist. Of those 546 players, 295 of them actually made it all the way to the end of the demo. On average, each player has died 122 times in game, has paused 25 times, and has collected about four secret red atropa blossoms. I'll explain a bit more in a little bit on what these numbers actually mean to us as game designers. This next section is where things start to get more interesting. Remember how I said data needs to tell a story? In Steam stats, I set up variables that track how many players complete each section of the game. Chapter one of Tethergeist is organized into several rooms and using the room end trigger in Game Maker, I'm able to see how many players finish each room of the chapter. So this chart tells the story of how players slowly drop off through throughout the game, which honestly is to be expected. You can see, for example, that of the 546 players tracked here, 544 of them finished the tutorial section. The bars here that are red, they're a second scale that tells a contextual story of how many deaths happen in each room. I really like this first data point where we see only two people didn't finish the tutorial despite it eliciting over 7,000 deaths. Players are dying in the tutorial and then trying and trying again, over and over until they figure out the mechanics of Tethergeist. This data point is honestly extremely encouraging to us. It tells us that the tutorial is working. Players are learning by trial and error, and they're sticking with it until they complete the tutorial. Proof that the tutorial works, and it works well. Each point on this chart tells a piece of that full story, and that's something that just makes me really excited about how we can use data to understand our player base. Below this chart is a deeper dive into the data points that fuel it, and honestly, I think this table is my favorite part of the report. Something about horizontal bar charts embedded in tables just makes my nerdy little data heart sing. Anyway, you might have noticed in the chart above that departure room E had a really high death count. This is the room with this obstacle here. For those of you who've played Tethergeists, you know this part is pretty tough. What's interesting about this room though is that despite having a high death rate, you can see here that the average player dies over 40 times at this part, players are not quitting at this part. Of the 411 players who start departure room E, 96.1% of them complete it. That's a fantastic completion rate. Only six players quit the game at this point. This is exactly the kind of experience we're trying to design, something that is very challenging, but not so unforgiving that players just give up. We want players to say, oh, that was so close, but I know I can beat this. We want to provide that sweet, satisfying feeling of completing something difficult. And it looks like Departure Room E is doing exactly that. Now compare that with Departure Room F, which is the room where we introduce the spikes that only activate when the player performs a spirit split. This room is exhibiting the exact opposite trend that we saw in room E. It has a low death rate with players only dying on average eight times here, but it has a high drop off rate with only 85.6% of players finishing this room. Now, before we jump to conclusions, I want to provide a word of warning in the world of data analytics. I see it time and time again, where people see a data point and jump to a conclusion, assuming they know exactly why the data looks the way it does. Sometimes that conclusion is right, but sometimes it's wrong. And maybe most often it's only partially right, but there's a lot more to the story. So in this case, it might be easy to jump to the assumption that players are so tired after completing room E, the one with the high death rate, that they're more ready to quit playing when they finally make it to room F. I think this is likely part of the story, but it's not the whole picture. What else could cause players to quit playing? One of the biggest reasons I've seen in playtests isn't that they're tired of playing, it's that an obstacle feels too impossible to complete. The obstacle is making them say, oh, there's no way I can do that, rather than, oh, that was so close, I bet I can beat this. 
One of the people on our Discord server, Dualgen Studios, shared a video of him and his daughter playing through Tethergeist, which by the way, Dualgen Studios is way cool, you should check out his channel. And I noticed his daughter really struggling on room F in this wall jump section. As the game's developer, I personally have never struggled with this section, so it was enlightening to see that it's not as simple as I had initially assumed. This qualitative data point, watching a single player struggle with this section, helped complete the full story, and it became clear to me that at least part of why we have such a steep drop off in players in this room is because this wall jump section seems unattainable. It makes players say, I don't think I can get up there, and they quit sooner because of it. Honestly, this is actually what I don't want players feeling here, especially considering that this room should be a bit of a breather after how sweaty we made the player in room E. Now it's funny, all of this digging has resulted in a pretty tiny change. I've just added one 32 by 32 pixel block to this section to make the wall jump easier to land. But I think it'll make a big difference in the overall flow of difficulty in the game, and hopefully we'll see less players quitting when they get to this section. I've also added input buffering for wall jumps, specifically for sections like this. Now further down in this report, I've created a section that shows the raw summary numbers and gives a trend line that more explicitly shows room completion rates. This chart is of course super helpful to my team and myself in finding problem areas where the completion rate is lower than average. I've already pointed out room F, but we're also seeing pretty low conversion rates in the lookout room and the night section of the hometown. Both are sections that we'll be analyzing in more depth and adjusting based on what we find. This final section of the report is a sort of write-up of all of the key takeaways I've found in this report. Things like what we're doing well already, what we can change in our game based on our findings, and some standout data points that deserve a closer look. I'll probably make a video that goes into a deeper dive of all of these findings, but for now, suffice it to say, we have found tons of valuable information here. So anyway, that about wraps things up for now. We launched our playtest build on Steam, set up analytics, then generated a report that gave us tons of insights into what our players are doing and what we can do to adjust our game's design based on what we found. Hopefully all of this can help show you guys just how much we care about this game and how much we care about you as our players. We want to create a challenging yet satisfying experience and running analytics like this is just one more way we're striving to do that. If you're interested in playing Tethergeist yourself, head on over to Steam and wishlist the game. You can also join our Discord server to stay in the loop, and of course, subscribe to this channel to see more videos like this one. We love this game, and we love you guys. Thanks for watching. 